Anyone excited to be alive today? Any of you? Anyone excited for May, for spring to finally come to us, maybe? 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 Hey, uh, last week was really cool across both locations. Uh, there were hundreds of people that stood up to dare to share. And I've been getting stories all week of people who finally had that conversation with that person that they've been delaying and and uh, maybe that was you. And don't forget to grab that ping pong ball today and write their name on there and drop it in that slot there as we our challenge as a church to keep sharing our faith, 700 uh, gospel conversations. If you didn't do that yet, then hey, you always obviously have today and next week and just maybe continually be a church that evangelizes so we will not fossilize. I love that quote. Uh, so last summer, I attempted to surf. And uh, I dared myself, I challenged myself to surf. And so one of my good buddies, Mike Snyder, Hot Apple Snyder, uh, I call him, he uh, took me to this beach and, uh, to learn how to surf. This is apparently, it's Doheny Beach in California, and this is apparently where the kids learn how to surf. Easy peasy, right? Okay. Now, when I was picturing surfing, I was thinking like smooth, silky sand, you know what I mean? But if you notice the picture here, there's rocks everywhere, okay? I mean, so I'm like, are you kidding me? So we get out there, and it's like super shallow, and you have to go really like a football field out into the water, it felt like. And I'm walking on these rocks, and my feet are killing me. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. So I finally get out there, attempt to try to hit a couple waves. Didn't go so well at all. And I'm crashing and hitting my shoulder on the rocks. I'm bleeding everywhere. It's like, this is ridiculous. So now I start making the trek back, but I, I can't even walk anymore. My feet are on fire, like literally on fire. And I, I can't believe I'm doing this, but here's a vulnerable clip of me that my wife took of me coming in. Uh, you can watch this. Um, hey, babe, how you doing? There's Shamu just coming in there. I'm coming in here and just... I have to literally, I'm like crawling, I'm like, just listen here. How you doing, babe? <laughs> I'm good. Did you cut your foot? Huh? Did you cut your foot? I'm all freaking wrong. <laughs> all right, enough's enough. Now, did anyone else notice the empathy and the kindness coming from my voice, from the, my, my wife's voice? Thank you, sweetheart. Thanks for caring for me and looking after me. I really appreciate that. You're so, you're so caring. Anyways, um, so I get back. I get there. I, get, I go up to Mike. And I'm like, yeah, why are you trying to kill me out here? Like, why are you taking me here to learn how to serve? This is like, I'm whining. I'm complaining. I'm like, where's the water shoes? Like, why wouldn't we have water shoes for this? This is like, this would have made everything a lot easier and better. And we're talking and I'm laughing and we're, they're just, we're, we're cutting up. And while I'm whining and complaining, there's this hipster surfer mom that speaks up. She's right next to us. She's like, in California, we don't use water shoes to surf, sir. And I was like, I was like, okay. And she says, if you want to be a California surfer, you need to muscle up if you're going to stand up. And I'm like, okay. I'm thinking of a really good comeback to give her, you know. And it, and I was about to say something, and then I watched her seven and nine year old literally like run off into the waves on the rocks with their surfboards. I'm like, okay, I got nothing. If you want, but if, if you want to be a California surfer, you got to muscle up to stand up, which got me thinking. If you want to be a Jesus follower, you got to muscle up to stand up. Literally, we have to build these spiritual calluses on our feet, if you will to stand up for the things that we're all going to face in this life, for the chaos of life, for the calm in life, for the pain in life, and for the pleasures in life of standing up. And as we continue in our series on Daniel, truth and dare, we're going to be looking at three guys that dared to stand up. These three guys are guys where maybe you've heard about before. Repeat after me. You ready? Shadrach, Shadrach. Meshach, Meshach, and Abednego. Abednego. One more time. Shadrach. Meshach and Abednego. Just feels good to say those names, doesn't it? And we're going to see them standing up in some very, very difficult temptations and some very, very difficult circumstances. And our hope today is that all of us will learn some tips from these guys to help us stand up when we need to stand up, to stand up for the things that we need to stand up for and to stand up for the things that we need to stand against 
And specifically today, as we lean into what we need to stand up against when it comes to idols that we'll face in this life. But before we do, since we're daring to stand up, let's stand up. Let's just do it. Let's stand up and let's pray and ask God to just move in this place as we already have. But let's just ask God to speak to us. So Heavenly Father, speak to us. Just, just tell him that. Just say, God, speak to us. Speak to me. We need you. Speak to us. Um, Father, I, I know there are people who, in this room who have been following you for years. And I know that there are people in this room that are still trying to figure it out and they're still exploring. God, we're just, we're here. We're, we're like, help us to, to just hear what you have to hear and, and absorb it and then let it shift us and change us. Uh, get me out of the way as always. And I pray this in the power of your son's name, Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. All right, go ahead, have a seat, grab your Bible, grab that dirt, Daniel journal. I hope you've been liking these journals as we mark things down so that'll leave a lasting mark on our own lives. And so these are so cool. I, I love having this. I hope you do too. And we're going to be in Daniel chapter 3, starting in verse 1. And here it goes. It says, King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and its breadth six cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Now, I'm not going to go into all the historical stuff because we uh, already went through that on chapter 1 and chapter 2. You can check those out online. Uh, but let me just catch you up here because when you go from chapter 2 last week to chapter 3, when you turn the page, we're looking at about a 15 to 16 year gap. Okay, a 15 to 16 year gap. And that's important because in chapter two, if you remember, uh, in chapter two, King Nebuchadnezzar, this evil pagan king, uh, got this dream that was keeping him up at night. He was having restless nights. And then God had Daniel uh, get the vision of what his dream was about. And so Daniel explains this dream to King Nebuchadnezzar. And King Nebuchadnezzar understands that the interpretation of this dream was not good for him. That he, he, he dreamt of this statue that we saw, this statue that had a head of gold. And the head of gold represented him, king, the king of Babylon, and how the empire of Babylon would someday be destroyed, be just completely toppled over on its head. And so here we are, turn the page to chapter 3, 16 years later, and guess what? Babylon's not weaker. It's gotten stronger. It's not more poor. It's actually even more rich. And he's thinking to himself, well, maybe that dream isn't going to come through like, a, like, like Daniel said. And so what does he do? Just builds a massive golden statue of himself. Just, you know, puff him in his chest, if you will, you know. Like, look at me, look at me. You know, like, I'm strong. I am powerful. No one's going to take me down. So talk about some serious pride, some serious ego, if you will, building this golden statue of yourself. So this brings us to the first point that we're going to recognize today is this thought right here. You know what the world needs? And I want you to say this with me. Here we go. A little more of me. Say that again. A little more of me. You said it. You said it. Now, oftentimes we don't say that, but that's how we live. That's how we wake up in the morning feeling that this world needs a little more of me, which reminds us of the first idol that we have to constantly stand up against, and that's standing up the idol of control if you're taking notes. Man, this is hard, right? Every time you wake up in the morning, you're not thinking of others, you're thinking of me. Or you're forced to think of others, but really you want to think of yourself, you know, especially if you have kids. And it's just this idea of, 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 of like the spirit of, of selfishness, the spirit of me is alive and well. Come on, everyone wants to be king. Everyone wants to be Jesus. I mean, all of us, if, if we don't like the way that things are going that are set in motion by God, we try to change it and shift it and manipulate it into the way that we want it. It's that pride, which is the root of all sin. So how do you, how do I stand up against this idol of control? Of me in charge, me, me, me. I don't, I don't know how this plays out in your life. Maybe it's, I wrote some things down, you know, maybe it's do you work just so others can see it? Are you generous just to get an applause? Are you putting others first instead of yourself? When you think about all your different relationships, how do we stand up against the idol of me? And this is something that we got to deal with every single day. But here's one ammo uh, that, that you can hold on to that I just, I encourage you, if you're taking notes, this is an ammo to help you fight against this idol that we have to fight against every stinking day of our lives. And that's this, John 3, 30. Read this with me. He must increase, but I must decrease. 
If you don't have that memorized, or if you've never memorized a verse before, I encourage you, memorize this verse. He must increase, but I must decrease. Pretty easy, right? Let's just say it again. He must increase, I must decrease. So when you're in a fight with your spouse, he must increase, I must decrease. When your boss is going at you, he must increase, I must decrease. We're talking about God, not the boss. Okay, just kidding. No. Um, but you get the, you know, it's, it just, it helps center your mind to get yourself out of the pride of me and wanting the control. Let's keep going. Then it says in verse 2, then King Nebuchadnezzar sent to gather the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, and the counselors, and the treasurers, and the justices, and the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces, which, a.k.a., these are really important people, okay? These are really important people, uh, to the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Keeps going. Then the, all those important people uh, gathered for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And the herald, the messenger, proclaimed out loud, You are commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that when you hear the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, the trigon, the harp, the bagpipes, which we know the Scottish were probably there. Okay, this is cool. Which I was thinking, we missed the ball. We totally dropped the ball, Maya. We should have had bagpipes today, just going for it, and we missed it. Dang it. Next time. And every kind of music... You are to fall down and worship the golden image of the king that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Is that all I have for that time? Have we got another one? Um, Yeah, keep going. Here we go. Yeah. And and whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into the burning, fiery furnace. Look out. Therefore, as soon as all the peoples heard all those instruments and, and, and languages fell down, what do they do? They fell down and they worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. What does this remind us? What does this show us? This reminds us of the importance that we need to stand up against the idol of conformity. The spirit of Babylon is a symbol that has been used from the 600 BC, 500 BC, all the way here till now. The spirit of Babylon, who is the dictator of the spirit of Babylon, is Satan and the evil one, the devil himself. That spirit is alive and well today. This isn't just ancient times. This still goes on today. Hence, take a look at the Turkmenistan leader, how he erected this golden statue of himself for the people to bow down to. Or the past uh, emperor of China, the Mao Zedong, right here. This, this, um, before its completion, this is a picture right before it was completed, but before it was completed, they actually took it down. But there's also 2,000 other statues of him that people in China bow down to, to this day. Not to mention, right now, what's going on in North Korea, there's Kim Jong-il and his father. Look at these people just coming to bow down. This is like this is going, this is like the statue. This is like this is happening, okay? Bow down or else. Now, today we live in America, and right now we're not being called to bow down to a 90 golden foot statue, but what are we being called to bow down to? 90 different ideologies from 90 different angles getting us to bow down to the ways of the evilness of Babylon, to the ways of the world of Satan. Constantly trying to force us and manipulate us, desensitizing us, and then after a while we get forced and put down our throats so much that we just begin to rationalize it and move further and further away. Then the next thing you know, we don't even realize what we've kind of bought into. But here we have this amazing example of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego deciding not to bow down to it, but standing up. And not only did they stand up, they stood out. Scholars estimate that in this moment, there was most likely more than 300,000 people that were gathered together in this moment that at, when they started to play the instruments, they all fell down to their faces. And then there's three guys standing up. Which then got me thinking this morning, you know that there were other people in that crowd that worshipped the God of Yahweh. And yet, they bowed down. It's not that big of a deal. Uh, You know, no one really, I mean, I'm doing this, but I don't really mean it. And they compromised. And they rationalized. Not that big of a deal. It reminds me of a quote from a pastor friend who, who said this to me a few weeks ago. The devil doesn't need to destroy you. 
He just needs to distract you. I've been chewing on that for the last couple of weeks. The devil doesn't need to destroy you. He just needs to distract you. How are you being distracted by the idols of the world by Babylon? Maybe it's some worldview that has completely shifted the way that you think instead of leaning into God's view. There's so many different idols of this. Maybe it's the idol of politics. Maybe you spend more time defending your side of the aisle and spending more time defending the hope of the gospel. Check your time on that. Maybe it's the idol of money and success. I mean, come on, like all of us have to some degree have this, but you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. Like it's, it's like you get this, you get this, and it's just never enough. You always need something more. Some of the richest people I know, multimillionaires, are the most depressed people that I know and the most ungenerous people I know, least generous people I know. But yet they still keep chasing the idol of money. Maybe it's the idol of pleasure. It's like you just can't wait. You're working till Friday night. And it's whatever, if it's sex or if it's alcohol or whatever drug or thing it is, maybe that's why you're watching online today because you're still sobering up from whatever happened last night. But it's that, that, that thing, that, that's that chase that you know it never satisfies. It always leaves you wanting more, but it's become an idol for you. Maybe it's the idol of some hobby or some sports thing. Where like literally you know every stat on every ball player, but you couldn't quote five verses in the scriptures if you tried. What is that thing? What is that idol? And maybe you're not like completely all, you know, like this to it. But, you know, maybe you're just, you know, one foot down, one foot up. You're still bowing down. The devil doesn't need to destroy you. He just needs to distract you. Let's keep going. Therefore, at the time, uh, certain Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews, and they declared to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of all of these instruments shall fall down. I'm on a time clock, okay? I got to keep going. Uh, Shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. But there are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. And so they brought these men before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, if you are ready when you hear the sound of all of those instruments, (laughs) fall down and worship the image that I have made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? And we pause here. And I just imagine, like, maestro, play that funky music. (laughs) But it reminded me. Satan's got a band. And they're good. They can rock. They can shred. They're really skilled. They're really talented. They got a great director of their band. But our God, he's got a band. And he's the director of all directors and his band is louder and sicker and more skillful and can play notes that are literally off the charts that people have never even heard before. He's the director of all directors, the orchestrator of all orchestrators. But notice this. What we just read, it said in the moment that when they heard the music, that literally the the, the nation was literally bowing down and worshiping. It literally reads as, as soon as they were hearing, they were falling down. That was total, immediate obedience, bowing down to a pagan golden statue. That was their posture, which then made me think, As Jesus followers in the room, I just want to talk to all you Jesus followers in the room, we come into a place every Sunday to not worship a golden statue, but the King of kings and the Lord of lords. What is our posture? Are we just kind of like, 
I'm not saying you have to be a great singer. I'm just saying, like, what's your posture when you come in? When the music plays, what's your posture? I mean, like, are we, are we just folding our hands and putting our hands in our pockets? All right, Joe, hurry up. Come on, let's go. Or are we, like, reminding ourselves that we are not worshiping a golden statue that's going to be toppled and destroyed. We are literally worshiping the great I am, the holy of holies, the king of kings who has rescued us and redeemed us. Where are your hands lifted to? Maybe, I'm not saying you're going to be like jumping in the aisles and having a circus in here. I'm not saying that, but I'm just saying with reverence and in awe, maybe you're bowing your head and you're just with your hands and you're just like contemplating the truths of how Jesus has saved you. May we check our posture as we worship the one true God. And in our closing song today, I hope we can remember that. Then it continues, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered to the king, O King Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. Wow. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. Notice the confidence and the assurance. My God is able to save. He is willing to save. He will deliver. But then notice this. But if not, but even if he doesn't come through, even if he doesn't show off the way that we want him to show off, but if not, Let it be known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set. There's so many things that I could go off on a tangent with this, but here's one thing that caught me. It's not what was written. It's what was not written. It was the silence. Think about all those instruments that I keep skipping over. That's a lot of work. To get all these instruments, all these players together, tuning it all up, the orchestra's all ready to go. They're ready to jam. But because Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stood up, they shut the devil's band down. And in the same way, when we stand up in our faith, we too shut the devil's band down. Are you doing that with your life? Are you shutting the devil's band down? Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury. An expression of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And he ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated, which makes you kind of think like fire's fire. When you, like, what's the difference? When you go in the fire, you're going to burn. Okay. Uh, then he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and cast them into the burning fiery furnace. These men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, and their other garments, and they were thrown into the burning fiery furnace. Because the king's order was so urgent that the furnace was overheated, the flame of the fire even killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the burning fiery furnace. Now, Many of you in this room know the ending of this story, but pretend like you don't. They obeyed God because they must, not because it worked out best for them. They stood up and stood out and worshiped God even when it didn't make sense, even when it was difficult, even when it was painful. They stood up and were thrown into a fire. What would you do? Come on. This is hard. This is the other reminder how, maybe one of the hardest, that we have to stand up against the idol of comfort, of bliss, of happiness. How easy can we fall into the trap that the only time that we will worship God is if only it's going the way that we want it to. But the moment that God isn't showing off or showing up in the way that I want, then forget it. Where is your line? Where is my line?
Where's the slippery slope for you that you would finally just say, okay, enough's enough. All right, I'm out. I'm out. Choosing Christ over comfort. Holiness over happiness. So, there's so many ways that you can go in this direction, but I'm not going to spend time talking today about why God allows us to go into the fire and the trials and the testings. Uh, that I've done many messages on that, and I can refer you to some of those. Um, but what I want to remind us of is that God never promises us to take us around the fire, but he always has promised that he will stand with us in the fire. We learned in our Second Timothy series that as a Jesus follower, you cannot escape it. They're going to come. And your tests will be part of your testimony into the future. And so some of you in this room today, you're in a fire. And it feels like the furnace has been heated up seven times. It's something financially, it's something relationally, it's something maybe in your marriage, it's something with your job, it's something with, uh, uh, with your medical condition. I don't know what it is, and it's hard. And I'm not trying to belittle it. I'm not trying to like, make I know I, I, I'm not saying I understand what you're going through. But here's the encouragement from this message I want to give to you from God's word is stand up. Stand up in your faith. Be strong. Be courageous. Don't allow the enemy to bury you and make your faith weak. Stand up. Even though it hurts, even though it doesn't make sense, stand up strong in your faith. Being reminded of 1 Peter 1.7 when it says this, that these trials will show that your faith is genuine. Is your faith genuine? Remember, this is showing this. It is, it is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. Through your faith, it is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. Your test will be part of your testimony. You are being refined. You are being made even more pure. Stay strong and stand up in your faith. Then let's look at how this story miraculously ends. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and he rose up in haste and he declared to his counselors, did we not cast three men bound into the fire? <laughs> they answered and said to the king, true, O king, yeah, that's what, that, that's what we did. But he says, but I see four men unbound walking in the midst of the fire and they are not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. I wonder who that is. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, can come here, he says. And then Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego came out from the fire. And all the important people gathered together and saw that the fire had not had any power over the bodies of those men. The hair on their heads were not singed, their cloaks were not harmed, and no smell of fire had come upon them. And you know, like, when you're at a campfire for just a few minutes, you smell like fire for a week. These guys, I mean, they were in the fire. And then listen to what a pagan king of Babylon says. Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who has sent his angel and delivered his servants, who trusted in him and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. And then this will be one of the layers, this next line, one of the layers of the testimony of King Nebuchadnezzar's salvation that we'll read about next week. But check this out. I mean, come on. He makes a decree and he says, any people, nation, or language that speaks anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb, and their houses laid in ruins, for there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. And then Shadrach, and Meshach, and Abednego got a promotion. <sighs> Again, there is so much I could go on here, but I'm out of time. <laughs> so, Here's one thing that got me this week. Notice that 
before King Nebuchadnezzar got off of his throne to check out how Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were doing. Someone else got off his throne first and stood with those men in the fire. Reminding us that the world will always let you down. But Jesus will never let you down. And not only did he get off of the throne, around 500 B.C., to help three guys stand in an earthly fire. But just a little over 2,000 years ago, he got off of his throne to help save every single one of us not from an earthly fire, but from an eternal fire. That is coming. And I want you to notice this callback that Jesus makes in Matthew chapter 13. He makes a callback. Notice the parallel here from Daniel chapter 3 to what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 13. See if you see it. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will remove and they will remove from his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. And the angels will throw them into the fiery furnace, not an earthly one, an eternal one, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the thing that we don't like to talk about a whole lot in our world today, but it is truth. Every one of us will leave this earth and will either step into heaven or into hell. And this is the explanation of what hell will be like. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in their father's kingdom. And please, if you're not, if you're sleeping right now, wake up because this is really important, okay? Listen. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand this truth. It says, then the righteous will shine like the sun in their father's kingdom. This word righteous right here, You know who that's defining? Me. I'm righteous. And it's also defining some of you today that you can say that you are righteous. But it's not because of anything I've done or how good I am. It's because God loved you so much that he sent his one and only son, Jesus, to become, who was sinless, to become sin, to become unrighteous, so that we could be righteous. Do you have that title? Are you considered righteous? It's only by the power and the love of Jesus. Because he died for your sin and my sin. And not only died for it, but conquered it and rose from the dead three days later, proving that he truly is God. And the scriptures have made it so clear, God made it so clear that all who call upon the name of Jesus to make him Lord and stop bowing down to this golden statue and finally get to the point to bow down and surrender to King Jesus as the only one to save you from your sin, then you will be saved. Have you ever bowed down to King Jesus? Because if you're not bowing down to King Jesus, guess what? You're bowing down to something else. He loves you. What are you waiting for? And if you've never bowed down to King Jesus, let this be the day. And so I'm going to ask everyone to just bow their heads and close their eyes with me. Maybe there's something stirring in your heart where you're like, you know what, I haven't. I have been definitely bowing down to the ways of the world and Babylon. And I've, you know, this faith thing's just kind of been over in the corner of my mind. But I've never taken it seriously. I don't understand at all, but I I do understand today that I I want Jesus to be my king, and I want to bow down to him. I I want the title of righteousness. And so if that's you, I'm going to lead you through a real prayer between you and God, and you just make this between you and him. Just say, Father, in your own words, just say, Father, I'm done bowing down to the world. Just say that to him. And today, through my faith, I'm bowing down to you. 
forgive me for my sin. I repent. And then just with gratitude, just say thank you. Thank you for dying for me. Oh, thank you for rising again for me. And then just say this. Just say right now, in this moment, say that right now in this moment, I receive you, Jesus, to be the king of my life. As we continue to pray, my friend, if you truly meant that, then you no longer have to fear the eternal fiery furnace because your God will now stand with you forever. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the gift of knowing you. Give us the strength to stand up when it's hard. Forgive us when we bow down to the things that we bow down to. We need your strength. We need your help. Strengthen our faith. We pray this in the power of your son's name, Jesus. And everyone said, amen. Can we give it up for those who put their faith in Jesus for the first time today? Amen. Maybe you made that decision. Now you have the title of righteous. And that's amazing. And there's a party going on in heaven right now for you. And so I I just want to encourage you, tell someone. Like, don't walk alone. Let someone know. You can let one of us know, one of our crew members know. If it's easier for you, you can text the word on the screen. And we want to celebrate with you and then answer the questions as you continually move towards God. Our vision here is simple, helping people move towards God. Imperfect, flawed, messed up people just striving to move towards our amazing God.